Well, there you are. How's everybody doing? Ah, what a way to start. What a way. Charlie Group Podcast. Like, share, subscribe, comment, support the channel. Today, being in bands. I think everybody should be in a band, even if it's just like a, you know, once a year get together in a backyard party kind of not even, you know, just everybody should say they're in a band. I mean, most people do anyways, right? But being in a band, I mean, when you're younger, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's like, hey, in a band, you know. But I couldn't wait to be in the van with the band and going. And then it's two weeks later, you're like, you never want to get in the van again. (laughs) But you're stuck. (laughs) I had friends who weren't, you know, and we would uh, travel, you know, we'd go here. And we weren't touring, but we, you know. And there's like, man, I wish I could. I'm like, dude, no, you don't. No, you don't. Like, it's just, uh, and you don't want to own the band van. I made that mistake too. Like, uh, cause then your, your dumb ass will be running around, unloading, loading, load out, you know, no, but yeah, being in a band, I joined my first band when I was 15. And started gigging like pretty much right after that. I mean, granted, we were pretty, you know, awful, shitty cover band. I mean, we were 15 years old, you know. A lot of fun. A lot of fun doing like horrible covers. You know, I remember we were doing like, Don't Tell Me You Love Me. <laughs> Don't tell me you love me. And we just thought we were the shit, you know. Mr. Crowley, Mr. Crowley. The good old days. Like, it didn't make sense doing all these stupid covers. But we uh, had a lot of fun. And then you learn. I mean, the more bad bands you're in, you know. And then when I was around 17, maybe, I joined my next band. And we fell into gigs, too. You know, you want to play anywhere and everywhere. You know, you're rehearsing in the basement and. You know, uh, you're all over the place. You think you're great. But I think everybody should be in some form of band, you know, just have some friends on the weekend, you know, an acoustic guitar. Just a sing-along band or whatever, you know. Um, It's a lot of fun. And it's banding together. I mean, the camaraderie of your, that exist. And again, it's, it's, it was so much fun to me to play and, and learn it as you go. I mean, I was like, not the best, but you get better. I mean, you, uh, you know, you work with it. You work with what you got. And I was lucky enough that when I got into like my first real band, I was in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, which is a college town. And back then it was just so many good bands. I mean, I was exposed to all kinds of cool bands, art, uh, you know, people from all over the world living there. A lot of great bands. I mean, for a small town at the time, I thought it was a big town because I come from like a town of like 2000. And I'm like, oh, my God, look at this big town. You know, it was, it's a small town. But. Back then, it was um, great. I mean, the Green Street, which goes through Campus Town, was just hopping and had the downtown area and all these great bands. I mean, my fi- two favorite were like Digits and Titanic Love Affair. I mean, I, back then, those two shows, to this day, uh, some of those club gigs that I saw from those bands are like the best shows I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of bands. And I still go back to the, the shampoo banana, you know, those guys, uh, it was amazing. I, I was, I'm grateful. And I was lucky that I was exposed 
to all of that. Now, not that these bands are friendly, you know what I mean? Like I, I knew the guys in, in both bands, but, and they were friendly to a certain extent. You know, Ken of Titanic Love Affair uh, actually recorded my first demo, like my first solo demo. Thank you, Ken. And I, I, I was, uh, this is right around the time they got signed too. So I was exposed to these bands. And again, my band at the time wasn't nowhere near, and we knew it. Like we were in the same league as these bands. I mean, these guys were killers. They could like, again, to this day, some of the best shows uh, I've ever seen. And then when I moved to LA, uh, the digits have like a ton of credit in Los Angeles. Well, they did back in the late nineties. I mean, I don't know about the rest of the bands, but the uh, digits were definitely um, uh, a thing. I, I, you know, I used to have like, 10 digits t-shirts and I'd be walking around Hollywood and be like the digit, you know, kind of end up making friends that way. Like, Hey, you. and being exposed to that great music in Champagne Urbana and also the, uh, work ethic. Like we, even though we weren't the greatest band in the world, we had it down as far as like, okay, rehearsing, almost every day, you know, booking gigs, writing songs, doing this, flyering. And, you know, we were just uh, um, on it. We were, you know, we wanted to, and we knew we weren't that, you know, we were still half, like, I think, covers, half originals. Um, and, uh, you know, you work up to you. Then I got to the point where I wanted to do like my own thing. Like I wanted to do something totally different. Um, so I quit that band and it took me about a year to get my next band, which was Love Engineer. And then once we were in Love Engineer, it took another, you know, six months to a year to kind of get your groove and writing tunes and we recorded an EP. And we played a bunch. I mean, we were playing all every little town in Illinois. And then it included uh, Indiana, like Terre Haute, Indiana. We played Detroit. We played Chicago. We played Milwaukee. We were, again, we weren't touring. We didn't have a tour bus. But we were busy. It got to the point uh, that we weren't even playing locally. We would play, like, even if it was, like, Peoria and Springfield and um <laughs> God knows where. It's everywhere. And it was fun. The early 90s, it was there was it, it was going on. We opened for bigger bands and you know, doing our thing. But eventually, even that, like again, as an artist. You kind of get, I don't like to be too stagnant. I don't like to, oh, well, here we are, you know. Uh, and, as, and, and, and then writing, you write certain songs that just, isn't, you know, it, you know, I, I joined or, or got into Love Engineer. It wasn't, per, you know, technically my perfect situation. It's just these dudes were all juiced in. They were older. They already had, could get gigs. Uh, they had some interest. I was just like, fuck it. I'll. I'll do it. I mean, I, it wasn't what I wanted to do, but you know, you, uh, it was hard. Cause I was trying to do kind of two things, like be a singer in a band. If I could do that or start my own band, as far as like I was singing, playing guitar, give me a bass player and a drummer. And it was harder to find just a shitty bass player and drummer to, you know, I did that for like a year trying to jam with all kinds of people and, I was like, you know what? I'll join this band. We'll put the big together this band and we'll just, you know, I'll do that. I mean, it's hard, again, harder for me. I couldn't get the band lineup I wanted. And so I kind of shift gears. And then I was in Love Engineer for about four years. And pretty much at the height, we were, you know, uh, the band was just falling apart and um, it wasn't fun anymore. Nobody was talking. You know, we're trying to keep it together. Like, hey. So 
so you shift gears. You know, I, I moved to St. Louis, started working for my family. They had like an antique store. And while doing that, I was doing my, you know, uh, also acting as well. I was taking acting classes and I got a commercial, a BC powder commercial and um, eventually shot a film and wrote some scripts. But so I moved to St. Louis and around 94, 95, I discovered this company. It was called Musicians National Referral. And what they were is they kind of like connected bands with singers and whoever, you know, and I, I, so I joined, it was like a service you joined. Um, and I joined and it was legit. I mean, I, I, I got, uh, I think the first band that I, um, I mean, technically I didn't audition. I'll tell you the process. So Uriah Heap, I'd heard of Uriah Heap and the guys at Musicians National Referral, like, yeah, they got this, you know, and what it was playing to me was like a cycle, an album cycle. They want somebody for one album, a tour. It's going to be a pretty long tour, about a year make some cash, you know, and then go from there, see what happens. And I'd heard of Uriah Heap, but they, you know, so they had uh, the musicians, National referral guys had my music, hooked them up with, and then it just so happened that the dude in Uriah Heap was in St. Louis. Like he was also working at Ampeg or something. I think his name was like Ken Hensley or something. One of the dudes in Uriah Heap. So that kind of made, okay, well, you're already in St. Louis. We're here. You're here. I mean, we like your mute. You're a good singer. Let's, you know. So I, uh, you know, talking with their, they had a management guy. And so <laughs> that's the first time, honestly, that I, I dealt with like some kind of a corporate manager guy that didn't know shit about music, you know, would, uh, you know, just wanted to get into it for, you know, I used to be in real estate. Pardon me. I still got this stomach flu. So we on the phone, you know, this okay. Meet at this. It was either the dude from Uriah Heap's house or the manager's house. Anyway, it's like West County, nice, big. I would consider like a mansion. And I get there and uh I'm expecting to like sing, do something, you know, pick up an acoustic guitar, you know, like, that's just, you know, it's all about music. No, it was, and a lot of times that's what's frustrating is you're in these situations and it has nothing to do with what you're actually there for. So they were like, hey, look, you know, uh, at first it was just the manager was there. And he's like, yeah, the guys will be here, you know, um, I got to talk you through some, you know. Uh, and they were like, you know, honest, you know, you're young. I think I was 23, 24. And these dudes had already had a career. I mean, they were had a career and gone and come back, whatever, you know. And in my mind, I just wanted to see the world, make a little bit of money. Like, I honestly could give a shit about Uriah Heap. I didn't know. I think I knew one song. Um, <laughs> and I was honest about it. Like, hey, I, you know. So we met with the, uh, I met with the manager guy. And again, I can't, I couldn't relate to this dude. He, and his little, like, khaki shorts and polo shirt, like this preppy um then granted you need people not every you know behind the scenes you do want like people that can like, keep their shit together and you don't want some drunk or but uh just a void of sense of humor and you know just you know just uh just get up that you know so like okay yeah let's we got through that and he's like okay the guys are, are showing up and you know i thought like something would we would play a little something Listen to some music, like, so they get there and they, I, I remember like, as soon as they walk in, it's like, this ain't going to be good. Cause you know, I'm, I'm young. Here's these old dudes, you know, they're right heap and they got like shit, you know, feathers in their head, you know, just, uh, rock guys that weren't necessarily like my kind of style, but they wanted new blood, fresh blood, some guy that could scream like a banshee. And, um, <laughs> So the uh, let's get to the important stuff. So I thought, oh, okay, we bust out the guitar. And, oh no, 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 no! We're just gonna hang out and drink beers. See if we can, you know, relate. And I, I kind of got it. Like, yeah, you want to be able to like someone. And but we're just like standing around in the kitchen, and it was like them and me. It wasn't like, hey, come sit down. It was just more like they're like kind of critiquing me and looking at you. See, and it was, 
cool enough. I mean, they I didn't get like a lot of they were British too. Like it's just yeah, my is <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, so we had like about a six pack, and I knew I was like, man, this this is you know, and they're like, look, this this ain't gonna work out because we there there is it's just an age thing, and I was thinking the same thing. Like, yeah, I, I get it. Like, I I can't relate here. I mean, I'm uh, you know, I'm young and y'all are old. I mean. It's just what it is, you know. Have a good day. You know, so we didn't leave on a, you know, but it is kind of a, to me, like a waste of time. Like, should I even a fucking, you know, huh? Got no money out of it. I mean, again, I'm grateful that I even had the chance to get in there. and So, yeah, so that was Uriah Heap. And then the next one, there was a few, but the next one I remember was, uh, this band called Cry of Love. And I had, uh, they had like a song out in the early 90s. It wasn't a hit or anything, but I knew who they were. So I, you know, musicians, National Referral, the guy from Cry of Love, or remind me, okay, yeah, I like it. Let's, and again, a dev- <laughs> I forgot this guy's name. He's just devoid of sense of humor. Like this wasn't, you know, uh, and also almost like needy, like looking for something from me right off the bat. Like, okay, yeah, I'm going to send you these songs and then you write. Okay, like uh, I can do that, you know. I get these songs and they're just uh, they're just uh, just flat. Like there wasn't anything uh, just tired, hacky ass riffs, you know, kind of a, not a country, but a more black crozy you know just nothing there i mean and and and, um because you know i'll give you a week you can try to you know and i did i tried to put some you know uh (laughs) lyrics and melody you know trying to write a song and dude just wasn't i get to be honest he just wasn't nice he just wasn't a cool dude i didn't you know it's like hey and I didn't get that either. I mean, I, uh, matter of fact, the guy that got that is now the singer of Warren, who's he's a great singer. I mean, and 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 honestly, when Warren was out back in the day, I fucking hated Warren. Like they represented every you know cherry pie and all that horse shit. Like I hated them. I mean, I, I cursed their good names. But now that I'm older, and everything's so down and shitty, I kind of have an appreciation for that kind of hair band. Woo! Jerry Pie, like, yeah, I wish I could do that, you know. But at the time, I, 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 and that dude is a great singer. The guy who he he's a he's an awesome singer. So congrats to him. It's weird how you have all these like kind of connections, you know. You know, you eventually <laughs> end up like connect. It, it gets stupid. Or like, what's his name? How do I know? It's it. it You've been around the uh, the block, and then I had like um, some dude from Metal Church, Vanderhoof or something. The guy from Metal Church, they wanted. I know, no. By then, I was just like, enough of this. I, I don't want to. Um, maybe if I'd have stuck with it, I could have. But I just didn't. Uh, I'll just write my own little tunes and stick with what I'm. You know, I was about to make a movie and writing scripts and doing that kind of thing, auditioning for, you know, shitty commercials. But that whole, uh, again, I'm grateful because I know that people like toil in misery and don't really get anything uh, accomplished. At least I got, you know, some interest, you know, uh, and, and, it, and it, it continued. Like I would, people would, oh, yeah, yeah you know, and, and then by the time I moved to Los Angeles in 98, because I left Love and Jerry in 94, basically just did, you know, for that four years in St. Louis, kind of here, there, um, didn't really put a band together. I mean, I was re- rehearsing with bands and I thought that we, but it just never got to the point where we were like gigging or recording. And I demoed up my own little, I had a little four track. So I was demoing stuff up and, uh, 
But when I got to L.A., my uh, first roommate knew who I was. Because when I got there, I was just going to concentrate on my acting and, you know, pitching my screenplays and this, that, and the other. And he was like, my God, you're Charlie from Love Engineer. Like, why aren't you in a band? Why aren't you? And I was like, dude, I, that's, that, you know, I've been in Love Engineer for four years. I mean, um, and, and he, <laughs> we would start jamming. He was like, this is these jam. You know, so he would, we go, you know, in our living room, we set up our gear and we both had a pretty cool rig at the time. And we were just jamming, you know, and then he, I was, he was like, look, dude, we got to put it, you know, start this band, whatever. He put an ad in the recycler. And then he told me, he's like, look, Charlie, you know, I'm, I'm kind of using you, but we're going to, you know, we're trying to, and I was like, man, I don't know if I want to do the band thing, you know, and it's finally like, you know, there's other people you get to know. Oh, why aren't you? you know, love engineering. Hey. So I kind of went along with it. And so we, um, Picked a night, people had answered the ad, and we were rented a rehearsal room. Uh, I think it's on Selma. It's right across the street from Hollywood High. It looks like this old kind of motel rundown uh, and bands. A lot of bands used to rehearse. I mean, bands lived there. Uh, by the time we got there, it was just like this, uh, uh, <laughs> just gross couches in those places. And you wouldn't want to go to the bathroom and broken glass. And, or mirror, you know, the mirror in the band's all busted up. And so we, we set up our, we had a drum, we found some kind of drummer guy. And then it was me on guitar and singing. My roommate at the time playing guitar and we had a drummer. So the first guy to show up, we were looking for a bass player. The first guy to show up, in comes Sean from the Asexuals. Now I'd been a fan of the Asexuals. I knew exactly who he was. Walks in and I was like, man, what the, what, what the fuck are you doing here? Like, you we're looking for a bass player. And he, he was cool about it. Totally honest. He's like, yeah, you know uh, what? Really? I'm, uh, I'm looking to poach a band. And that's the first time I'd ever heard that. Like he's, he's just going at it. Like, look, I can find an existing band, you know? And he said that, look, I need to, uh, I, I need a bass player. Like I, I'm, I'm singing and playing guitar. I got a drummer and in like seven days. I got a gig at the mint. So I thought I would just grab somebody, you know, and then he knew about Love Engineer. He was like, oh, yeah, Charlie from Love Engineer. And again, I was kind of blown away that like, what? I mean, I knew we got airplay in L.A. back in the day and in, in New York, but it'd been years. I mean, it'd been like. But I had some street cred like, oh, and then again, Champaign-Urbana has this kind of cool, hip, you know, if you're, I'm, I was from that scene back then, whether people like it or not. I mean, that was I was in it, too. And it opened up a lot of doors. Like again, Champagne Urbana, man. They they uh, in L.A. We got some. It it it, it was uh, it was a cool thing. So uh, the these got my roommate and the drummer were like, huh? Well, what's going on here? And I kind of right off the bat, I go, you know what? You're right. Uh, I'll switch gears. I'll be your bass player, and we'll start playing. You know. And he also needed to sing, like co-singer, bass player, you know. And, um, and they were pissed. I mean, I, and I, <laughs> the other guitarist, my roommate, I mean, I had to go home that night. He's like, dude, what are you doing? Come on, I put the ad up. And I'm just, uh, and he kind of technically did. He kind of got me, sobered me up, you know, and got me on there. And then here I am going, now I'm switch, sh shifting gears. I mean, but that's just how, I don't, you know, if you're in a band or you're doing something, that's just how it is. I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking, wait a minute. I could toil along here or I could just jump on Sean's I mean, he, the asexuals were, you know, and technically he was still signed to a bigger label and had shit going on, new managers and this and that, you know, and like the next day, uh, I met Sean on at guitar center on sunset and brought some gear and I ended up like trading. I got a, uh, like a Fender P bass and then, a um, like a, a, a Fender 215 cab and like a rig. I mean, I got, I was ready to go. And sure enough, like a week later, we're playing like the mint and we're already banned. Boom. We're gone. You know, I learned Sean's songs and I had some songs I had and we, uh, um, it was a great time. It was a exciting time. And again, I didn't think that I was, I didn't move out to LA to be in a band. I wanted to, 
concentrate on uh, my acting and writing scripts. And um, one of my scripts had gotten like second rudder up at the Nickel Fellowship. And I'd been flown out to L.A. in like 96 and I'd met people and I, you know, uh, but all the while that I was in and we were called LaMotta. First, we were called Rumblefish, but there was another band called Rumblefish. So then we switched to LaMotta and we immediately started playing cool gigs. We immediately were playing all over, you know, even Orange County, the Daw Hut and uh, all the clubs in Hollywood. Um, and it was fun. A dog here barking. And I'm going to do an episode on my dogs. So, yeah, what do you do? I mean, you just kind of go along with it. You, you know, roll with the punches. You... We had a great time. Sean lived in uh, um, West Hollywood, and his roommate was like this legendary road manager guy. And I, uh, I shouldn't mention his name, but uh, he helped us out, too. He, he uh, you know, uh, but he had problems. He had a quick story about this dude. He, you know, um, was having problems. And he had a lot of cool gear and a lot of, he toured with all these bands. And one morning I'm over there around like 10 or 11. And uh, he busts out the uh, the black and white telecast, the Black Hole Sun telecaster, the sound guard, you know, been given to him. And he's going to go pawn it, man. It's like, dude, don't go pawn. You're not going to get, you know, anything. Uh, sell it to me. What do you think you're going to get at the pawn shop? Like $90, $100? I mean, I'll give you like $300. All right, yeah. It's not, yeah it's just, but I got to run to the bank now. It's only going to take, you know, it's just down the road. Don't do anything. Oh, what do you mean? I wait. And I was telling Sean, like, dude, try to keep him in here, lock him in his room. Um, and it was just a standard, like an American Telecaster, but it was the Black Hole Sun Telecaster. I mean, you know, and I needed a telly. So uh, long story short, I run. It takes me maybe 10 minutes. Come back. He's impatient and can't. I mean, it was that quick. He's at the pawn shop. I was like, are you kidding me? And we go into the pawn shop and he's, there's already a ticket filled out. We ain't got that. And of course, he his dumbass told them about what it was so they want the fucking moon now yeah i never did get the uh uh <laughs> the telly but he helped us out matter of fact he gave me um a briefcase road case that i have to this day which used to be owned by chris cornell matter of fact inside it it's got backstage passes when they were on tour with like voivod and uh um and I've try, I tried back in the day to donate that to Chris's family. You know, like, hey, you know, you might want this or put it into some kind of museum or something like that. Never heard anything like that. You know, if I still have it. And a lot of that is, uh, again, I'm grateful to have been able to somehow I've always been able to also attract certain things. Uh, it's just one of the it's a knack. I mean, I don't know. It just you, you just end up uh, bumping into people, you know. And everywhere of friends I've had or roommates or whatever are like, what? No, how, how are you? What are you doing? I'm just living my life. A lot of times I'm out walking my dog. I mean, it didn't like I'm because they're just kind of like star fuckers looking for any kind of angle, looking to me. This is the only nice to famous people and stuff. And I was never like that. And it drove some of my crazy that here I am just la 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 la, just, you know. And I'm getting asked to these parties and, um, you know, and I would bring some, certain people around and they don't know how to act. Like, they don't know how to be cool. Like, dude, it ain't, don't explain yourself. Oh, I'm, I'm going to, eh, needing approval from people. And just, dude, just be cool. Like, just uh, chill the fuck out. And then even LaMotta, like, we were, uh, Steve Kravak, 
a Porterhouse Records and Greg Hetson, they paid for like a three song demo, La Mata. And, and Greg, I mean, uh, Steven insisted that I, we record one of my songs. And that's kind of put put the uh, a rub with me and Sean. Like, even though we're friends and stuff, for some reason, he was competitive about, you know. And Steve was, you know, you know, just giving Sean shit. Like, he's like, oh, man, Charlie's a better singer than you and a guitarist than you. Like, Dude, don't be, you know. Because I'd switched to, to uh, bass guitar. But in the studio... We were using my Les Pauls and I had good gear. And it was Steve who said, Hey man, you don't want to be the bass player in Lamotta. I mean, this is kind of Sean's thing. Like if you want to go solo or if you do start, I will help you out. He kind of got that in my ear, like, okay. And again, at the time, Lamotta was kind of taken off, getting interest. And I knew that I was like, he's right. Like I've got to switch gears. Pardon me and do my own thing which i did and everything was cool i mean for a while there me and sean weren't like you know as close as we were but then again i ended up writing like on their both albums i mean they, they, they uh i wrote songs and then they covered some of my songs like they covered orange county girls um i think that was their single and then my song pity now they changed a few lyrics and called it Titty Life, which, I mean, <laughs> hey, whatever, you know. Another rub is there is no credit. I don't, there isn't my name, all that LaMotta stuff. They won't, written by, none of that. I don't know why people are like that. I mean, I, I don't get it. And when I left LaMotta, they, then they got signed and then they went on a European tour and, and I'd always wanted to go to Amsterdam and Ireland, wherever the places they were going. But in the back of my mind, it's like, man, this is going to be worth it because I'll do my own thing, which I did. I recorded my first solo album. I was too, you know, insecure to use my own name, but I used Darting Oxcart and uh, recorded the same EP twice. That's another story. Um, and got a lot of attention. Like I got, you know, uh, and then after that, I decided, like, you know, I'm just going to do my own solo. Thing. I'm just going to use my name, start branding my name. Um, as cheesy I, as I thought that was, it's just like I got to the point where, like, you know, band names are for, like, codependence. I just need to, like, do my own thing, forget about what's going on. Just, And I did. And uh, I'm glad I did. I mean, sometimes there's a hump, there's a little downtime, and you can come back and rise like the phoenix. Yeah, everybody should be in a band. Everybody should uh, at least have some kind of barbecue, sing along, something or other. You'll be much happier. And look, I love y'all. I'm going to get out of here. It's been good. <laughs> so be blessed. And I'll see you tomorrow. Cheers.